minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you, and I again, I appreciate the privilege to address you here on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And I come to this floor uh, to uh, to voice my concerns about the direction uh, some of this executive and legislative bodies seem to be going. And I've started out this way, Mr. Speaker, that yesterday it finally occurred to me how to describe the political whiplash that has taken place that goes against the logic and history and experience of myself and I think a majority of the American people. And I said to them yesterday in an immigration meeting inside the Republican Study Committee that had a panel there of House and Senators there to talk about immigration, some of them experts, and uh, I said I feel like Rumpelstiltskin. And the story of Rumpelstiltskin was that he went to sleep under a tree and he was clean shaven and when he woke up he had this long long beard that apparently grew over a century or so and the, sh the culture shock that he got after having taken a little nap was what the narrative of the story of Rumpelstiltskin was about well I went to bed the night of November 6 and having finished uh, election celebration having succeeded in, a, in another election but I watched as Mitt Romney um, had to concede that he had not win the presidency from Barack Obama. I understood what that election was about as much as most anybody in this country. It starts in Iowa and we spent nearly four years sorting out and helping to contribute to the knowledge base of the American people as to what the planks in the platform would be, what the platform would look like, how we select a nominee for the President of the United States. It starts in Iowa with the First in the Nation caucuses and the candidates that come there, many of them will go to all 99 counties. Rick Santorum, for example, had over 380 meetings in Iowa, and he went to all 99 counties. Michelle Bachman went to all 99 counties. That's an endorsement from the Iowa caucuses that can be earned. You don't have to have millions of dollars to shape a media image and buy a nomination, but it is important to be there and talk. So we do this. We're all politics all the time. And I'm engaged in Republican presidential um, nominating process from early on. So I watch this and I contribute to it and I weigh in on the things that I believe in and I've listened as every presidential candidate has endorsed, let me just say this, my immigration ideas. And yet, as I listened to the debate and Mitt Romney won the nomination and he and Barack Obama had their multiple debates, three debates if I remember, and there's much debate that goes on throughout the media, I don't think anyone went to the polls on November 6th thinking this election is about immigration. I went to bed the night of November 6th having realized that Barack Obama will be president for another four years, a disappointment to be, a crushing disappointment to many of us who had so many big plans on what we were going to do to put this nation back on the right track with a new Republican majority anticipated in the United States Senate and a President Mitt Romney. It didn't work out that way. But I never believed on that night that the election was decided on immigration, Mr. Speaker. It was not. The debate was almost exclusively about jobs in the economy, jobs in the economy, jobs in the economy. It was, it was drilled so relentlessly and so often that it put the American people to sleep. And I said so before the election multiple times. This needs to be more than a, a race about jobs in the economy. Nevertheless, that seemed to be what the pollsters on the Republican side were advising Mitt Romney needed to be continually coming out. So the American people went to the polls doing what they do. They make decisions based upon what they hear people talking about. And you can track polling, uh, and I have looked at it for years, that polling is going to have the highest priority that people's concern will be the one that people are talking about, one the media is talking about. National conversations are many times driven through the media. These conversations of a presidential election was about jobs in the economy. I went, to, I went to bed that night on the November 6th disappointed, perhaps even crushed at the loss of opportunity that this nation would have. I woke up the next morning, not with a beard that was 100 years long, but just a normal one from a night's sleep, 
not thinking that there was anything except jobs in the economy and the promise of the president to expand the dependency class and telling people that you're going to have to have you're going to have less personal responsibility under Barack Obama and you'll have more risk under Mitt Romney that was part of the argument jobs in the economy grow the dependency class that was the argument but when I woke up on the morning on November 7th I began to see some of these things come through the news this analysis that Mitt Romney would be president-elect on November 7th if he just hadn't said self-deport. Or Mitt Romney would be president on November, president-elect on November 7th if uh, he hadn't lost such a large percentage of the Hispanic vote. And then the numbers began to trickle in a little bit, and you get those numbers that show that, and I don't dispute them, that Mitt Romney got about 27 percent of the vote and of the Hispanic vote and Barack Obama got 71 percent of the Hispanic vote. So the people who had promised that Mitt Romney was going to win the presidency including pundits who hung in till the polls were closed until the last minute still insisting that there were precincts coming in in Ohio that was going to turn the election in the other direction needed a scapegoat. They need a scapegoat to blame the election loss on because they had predicted that victory and contributed to the engineering of the campaign and had pushed the jobs in the economy argument to the detriment of some of the other topics that would have been useful to get a better turnout among conservatives. And so looking for a scapegoat, they began to say on November 7th, Mitt Romney would be president if he hadn't said these two words, self-deport. He'd be president if he had a larger percentage of the Hispanic vote. He lost too much of it. And this is the mantra that we saw that came out of President George W. Bush's campaign when he began to advocate for comprehensive immigration reform. And I remember an art, a document that was produced by the Republican National Committee chairman it was referred to at least as an autopsy or a post-mortem report that said again that Mitt Romney would be president if he'd gotten a larger percentage of the Hispanic vote and that George W. Bush got 44 percent of the Hispanic vote in 2004. That number has floated out there since the day after that election in 2004, but it's not true, Mr. Speaker. George W. Bush never got 44 percent of the Hispanic vote. That number is someplace between 38 and 40 percent. It was a stronger percentage than Mitt Romney got, but Mitt Romney was, uh, he was competitive with John McCain's vote on the Hispanic side, and it was clear John McCain's been an open border senator all of his life. The only time he ever really was for border security and border control is when he had to save himself from a primary, and that's when he said build the blank fence. And so what we have here is an irrational conclusion drawn on the morning of November 7th of last year that turns out to be a handy little scapegoat excuse change the subject matter for, for people who made predictions that didn't turn out to be, uh, didn't match what their professional opinion was. And, what it, and another thing that takes place is if you repeat something often enough in the news media you can convince people that that is, that is the topic, that was the subject. So, I will just tell you that in this conference people are now starting to understand the election wasn't about immigration. There is no mandate for Barack Obama to sign an amnesty bill. There is a strong desire on part of people that are for open borders to pass one. I understand why Democrats are for open borders and amnesty. They are the political beneficiaries of open borders and amnesty. Republicans are paying the price for this wedge that's being driven between the Republican Party, Mr. Speaker. And in political tactics, as well as warfare and military tactics, if you can split the line of your, of your enemy, your opposition, your competition, if you can divide them, especially if you can pit them against each other, you have much greater chance of success. This is a classical example of Republicans accepting an argument, in fact creating the argument, joining some of them joining with Democrats who gleefully drive the wedge in between the Republican Party to separate the rule of law, border security, pillar of American exceptional, exceptionalism, constitutional conservative Republicans away from the establishment wing of the party that sees this world a little bit differently. Conventional wisdom here is Romney be president if Republicans had done a better job reaching out to the Hispanic community. And I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, that's not true. 
There's no data that supports that theory. And even still, they insist on adhering to this. And when I ask them, what is in this Gang of Eights bill in the United States Senate that is passed out of committee now to be considered on the floor of the United States Senate? What's in that bill for Americans? The answer is nothing. There's nothing in that bill for Americans. What's in that bill then for, let's say, Republicans? Well, political disaster is in it. There's nothing in the upside of it for Republicans. What's in it for Democrats? Millions of new voters, more political power, a continued expanding of the dependency class, an erosion of the individual responsibility and the, and the God-given liberty and freedom that this country has. And that's the, that's the benefit to the Democrats' side of this thing, Mr. Speaker. And then, and what is the effect? The effect is pretty clear. You have a study done by the stellar Robert Rector of the Heritage Foundation, who does multiple studies. He is the most accomplished analyst that I know on this Hill, and his work has been subject to public scrutiny for more than two decades, and his work has been unassailable. When it was announced that he was doing an analysis of the economic impact of the Senate version of the bill, the amnesty bill, Immediately, his political opposition began to attack him personally and to attack a study they had never read. I know they never read it, Mr. Speaker, because it wasn't out and it wasn't released. And I got a, a verbal preview of that when Robert Rector came to speak before the Conservative Opportunity Society, which I have chaired for some years. And I knew that they hadn't read the report because it wasn't released. I would get access to one of the first copies. I have. I've read every page of the Rector Report. I believe it's 102 pages. There's a five-page executive summary. This report boils down to this, Mr. Speaker, that if you pass the Senate Gang of Eights Comprehensive Immigration Reform slash Amnesty Act, the net cost of the people who would be legalized uh, in America, even if you use the 11.3 million, which I think is a very low estimate, the net cost to the taxpayer when you calculate the drawdown from the welfare systems and the health care and the education and the infrastructure, he's got it all broken down in detail. The net cost, and then you subtract from that the net tax contributions made by this group of people, you end up with a $6.3 trillion price tag to the Senate's amnesty bill. $6.3 trillion. And still, Republican members of the gangs of eight, House and Senate, posture themselves as conservatives. They posture themselves as conservatives and they advocate for a $6.3 trillion net cost. And their best argument against the Rector report is it's not dynamically scored. I heard that yesterday from the gentleman from Idaho. The Rector report is not dynamically scored. If you dynamically score it, then presumably you could get around to a purist libertarian view that any time, and that's this, any time anybody does an hour's worth of work and contributes a dollar to the gross domestic product, they contribute to the economy. That's their theory. That's a very narrow view of what goes on in any country. If you're going to call it economic growth because the GDP goes up by a dollar, but it costs you two or three dollars on the other end out of tax receipts to fund the the stimulation to get that extra dollar, that's not economic growth, but they argue that it is. If you dynamically score the Rector report, it gets more costly, not less costly. It goes to the number from $6.3 trillion in cost goes up, not down. So I would suggest these people who are um, attacking Robert Rector or the Heritage Foundation or the people that are making allegations that the Rector report's not dynamically scored, Go in there and dynamically score the Rector report then. Tell me, what is your number? It's not good enough just to criticize somebody else's data without actually addressing the data. What's your number, gangs of eight? How much do you think the gangs of eight bills are going to cost the taxpayers for the people who would be legalized instantly? How much? And then they say, I want more legal immigration. More legal immigration. And you could ask them, how many are coming in here legally now? 
Most of them who make such a statement would be stumped, Mr. Speaker. They don't know. You don't know how many people are coming in here legally, say over the last decade. How can you assert whether there should be more or less? And if they think that if they do know the number, then I would say to them, you think there should be more legal immigration? How many is enough? How many is too many? There's two more stumping questions I've just asked. They don't know how many is enough. They don't know how many is too many. They're making a political calculation, not a policy analysis. It isn't good enough to change the destiny of the United States of America simply by wetting your finger and putting it into the air or checking your political barometer and making a decision whether it's a plus or a minus for you politically. Can you get reelected if you're for amnesty or not? That's some of the questions that's going on around this body. I suggest, Mr. Speaker, we have a higher charge and a higher challenge and a bigger responsibility. This is a constitutional republic. And one of the essential pillars of American exceptionalism is the rule of law. This shining city on the, on the hill sits on these pillars of American exceptionalism. And among them, many of them are in the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, religion, the press, peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances, Second Amendment rights, um, the, the right to be secure in our persons, the property rights that used to exist before the Kelo decision. That's a little editorial, Mr. Speaker. I'll take that up in another special order sometime. The rights that develop to the people, to the states or the people respectively under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, no double jeopardy, all of those things. If you take any piece that I've mentioned out of the history of this country, you don't get the United States of America. You can't be the United States of America without the law, without the rule of law. Millions of people come to this country to escape lawlessness, and we owe it to them as well as the heritage of all Americans to ensure that we do not have lawlessness institutionalized in this country. Amnesty is, to grant amnesty is, to pardon immigration lawbreakers and reward them with the objective of their crime. That's what's advocated by the gangs of eight, no matter how they want to spin it. And if they do that, they, w they will have provided an amnesty plan that can never be reversed, and they will have destroyed the rule of law, at least with regard to immigration, so that it can never be restored. Destroyed so it could never be restored. There is no way going back to this, uh, going back to what was if this legislation passes. And... I'll take us back to 1986. Ronald Reagan signed, he was honest with us, he signed the Amnesty Act, Mr. Speaker. And he was pressured, no doubt, and I'll just say I know this, by a lot of people who have good judgment almost all the time, good advisors, but the pressure that came was this. There are a million people in America, it started out about 750 to 800,000, but at the time the decision was made by Ronald Reagan, they said there are a million people in America that are here illegally, and we can't deal with all of them, so we want to get a fresh start. And we can make this deal with the Democrats in Congress that if you just sign, Mr. President Reagan, the Amnesty Act, we will ensure also in that bill that there would be border security. Shut off the bleeding at the border, and the trade-off would be we'll give amnesty to a million people. And Ronald Reagan, with his compassionate heart and his good principles and good judgment, didn't see what was coming. What was coming was the intentional undermining of the enforcement. Democrats never intended to enforce immigration law in 1986. Ronald Reagan accepted their word. His word was good. He didn't have a reason to believe theirs was not. It was not. It was intentionally not, not good. But President Reagan signed the Amnesty Act for the purposes of the one sole and only Amnesty Act that was ever going to take place in the history of the United States. That was the promise. And in exchange, we all had to fill out the I-9 forms with precision and fear that the federal government would come in and catch us in a technicality and lock us up in jail or fine us a great deal. I've still got I-9 forms that are in the dusty files from back then. I was sure that INS was going to show up and enforce against me. Well, it didn't happen. It didn't happen in my company. It didn't happen in thousands of companies across the, across the country. They didn't enforce it the way it was promised to be enforced. 
we got the amnesty all right, but we didn't get the border security. And now we have people that seem to have the wisdom as if they had born, been born since then and been denied access to the history books that seem to think that they can write laws that are immigration laws today that will put this thing away and finish adapting to immigration law for all time. They're saying, just listen to us, pass our gangs of eight amnesty bills, and we will fix the immigration problem for all time. It's clear to me that the lesson from 1986 didn't soak into them. They don't have a lot of gray hair. You don't have to have to pull out a history book and read it. In fact, just down the street, about any respectful member of Congress could, I believe, get a meeting with Attorney General Ed Meese, who was Ronald Reagan's Attorney General in 1986, whom I believe advised Ronald Reagan to sign the Amnesty Act. But Attorney General Meese, whom I greatly respect for his intellect, for his character, for his judgment, for his work ethic, he's still in the game wrote an op-ed in 2006 to deal with George W. Bush's amnesty proposal, and that op-ed said Reagan would not make this mistake again. And then now, some two or, three, two or so weeks ago, he released another statement that mirrors the 2006 statement. So we have, they could have the beneficiary, the benefit of Attorney General Ed Meese, and listen to what happened in 86. If these members were sincere about making an objective decision, they are not. They are salivating over putting their imprimatur on history and changing the character and the culture and the, and the direction of the civilization of America. Now, America has always been about assimilation. And we are, yes, a nation of immigrants. So is every other nation on the planet, by the way, so we should not overemphasize that. We're a nation of people that come together, that have assimilated different cultures and civilizations, and we have something I call American vigor. American vigor comes from these pillars of American exceptionalism that I listed most of them in the Bill of Rights. You add to that free enterprise capitalism. You add to that the faith of Judeo-Christianity and Western civilization all wrapped up together on this continent with essentially unlimited natural resources, the rule of law, manifest destiny. All of that was a magnet that attracted the vigor of every civilization here. We didn't just get a cross-section of people that came from Asia or Europe or South America or wherever that came to America. We got the dreamers, the doers, the vigorous people from every donor civilization on the planet. The people that came to work to contribute, that had ideas that were, they wanted to be unfettered by the, the ropes and chains and the restraints that their home country had and come to America to embrace the American dream. That's why we are America. That's why we have a can-do spirit. We got the best of the spirits of every single country on the planet. And we must preserve these pillars of American exceptionalism, including the rule of law, or this nation will never reach its God-given and intended destiny. That's why I stand so strongly on preserving respect and adherence to the rule of law. That's why I reject the president's lawless activities to suspend immigration law that he doesn't like and advance his political foundation in doing so the president has suspended the immigration law by the stroke of his executive amnesty is, is what he has done. That's what the debate was about last night with the King Amendment. That's what the vote was about this morning with the King Amendment that passed with a strong support in a bipartisan way. Some people, I think, took a walk. But in any case, my amendment said this. They'll not use any of the funds appropriated in the bill to enforce the Morton memos, which are the memos commonly referred to that come from the president's wish to grant amnesty by executive edict. And in one of those memos, the most famous of which, which established Dream Act Light, the, um, the, the, the president of the United States went out and did a press conference within two hours of the issuing of the memo that came from Janet Napolitano's office. And it, and it says in that memo, seven different times, We'll apply this on an individual basis only, on an individual basis only. I can repeat that five more times. Uh, that gives you a sense of what they put in the memo. They know that when you litigate something like this, the individual basis only is the reference to prosecutorial discretion. 
and an executive branch that has the prosecutorial discretion. It's well established. I agree with it. They can't enforce every single law. But the law also requires that when ICE encounters an individual that they believe to be unlawfully in the United States, they are obligated to put, place them into deportation proceedings. That's the law. The president suspended the specific laws. He, has, he created four classes of people under the Morton memos and then has begun to suspend the law that's being applied against these four classes of people. He's not doing it on an individual basis only. It's lip service on an individual basis only. And of 450,000 people that had already been adjudicated for deportation, they have now waived that on 300,000 and they're grinding through the rest. It looks like they're on the way to nearly a half a million people that get administrative amnesty. And this is before the DREAM Act light memo came out. That's another chunk of this. And, and we have, so the president has time after time, through the actions of his executives, defied his oath of office, which is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That's the president's obligation. It's his oath to the Constitution. He had his hand on the Bible when he gave that oath. And he gave an oath to our Constitution, and he gave a lecture to some, some students out here at a high school on March 28th of the year before last, I believe it was, and they asked him, why don't you just pass an executive order, sign an executive order to grant lawful status to the DREAM Act kids? And the president said, as a former adjunct constitutional law professor at the University of Chicago, accurately, he said, I don't have the authority to do that. The legislature passes the laws. My job is to carry them out. And the judicial branch is to pass judgment on the, on the meaning and the technicality of the law. Pretty good response for a constitutional law adjunct professor. And about a year later, the president decided he wasn't bound by his oath of the Constitution, neither was he bound by the analysis or the opinion that he gave the high school kids, defied his oath and he defied his own judgments, publicly stated, and granted administrative amnesty through a whole series of six different memos known as the Morton Memos. We cannot be a civilized country if we're going to have a president who legislates by executive edict or by press conference, by the way, Mr. Speaker, you'll remember that the uh, Obamacare was not supposed to fund abortion, nor was it supposed to fund contraceptives or sterilizations. And there was an accommodation that was made in, a, in an amendment here and some negotiations with the president, but they do it anyway. They impose this on our faith communities as well. And our churches filed multiple lawsuits, more than I can actually quote into this record today, to object on the grounds of religious liberty this country shall not impose a violation of religious liberty on our faith people. And it shall not draw a distinction between an individual's faith, a private sector business's faith, or a church itself. It's all the same. No one is, ex no, no one is, is exempt from the protection of our First Amendment rights. Yet, this administration goes after them and when he heard the heat that came back from the churches, and particularly the Roman Catholic Church, the president did a press conference at noon on a Friday, and he said, I'm going to make an accommodation to the religious institutions. An accommodation. Now I'm going to require the insurance companies to provide these things for free. Abortifacients, contraceptive sterilizations, and he repeated himself, for free. The president can't do that. Even if the rule further defines the Obamacare law that passed, that rule has got to be published. It's got to go through the administrative procedures uh, course of action. The president cannot just simply with impunity and utter arrogance step up to a podium with the great seal of the President of the United States on it and say, now I'm changing things. Hugo Chavez does that. Barack Obama did that. He legislated by press conference. And now we have more lawlessness coming to... to um, undermine the rule of law, grant an amnesty to 11 million people that if history shows us right will be 33 million people. If you, if you score that dynamically, you take 6.3 trillion times three and you get better into the zone on what this could cost. This house is going to stand and oppose amnesty. It's going to defend the rule of law. It's going to protect the dignity of every human person, God's gift to this planet. But this country is also God's gift to this planet. And I urge, Mr. Speaker, all of those that are listening to this discussion we're having, and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, 
let's stick with our oath of office, let's stick with our oath to uphold the Constitution, let's defend the rule of law, let's have a smart legal immigration policy that rewards people that follow the law and can come here and contribute to this country. We cannot be the lifeboat for all of the poverty in the world, but we can be the inspiration for all of God's creatures on this planet. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman have a motion? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move the House do now adjourn. The question on the motion is to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. on Monday, June 10, 2013. So that wraps up work in the House for this week. Earlier today, members approved a bill funding the Homeland Security Department for fiscal year 2014. It's the second of 12 such bills that the House has taken up dealing with funding for the federal government for next year. The $46 billion measure includes $5.6 billion for emergency disaster relief, and it increases funding by 7 percent for Customs and Border Protection. The House will be back on Tuesday at noon Eastern with legislative work scheduled for 2 Eastern. Lawmakers will devote most of the week on the House floor to debating the annual defense policy bill. That measure would authorize programs aimed at maintaining and improving the nation's military and long-term strategic capabilities. The bill would authorize a total of $638 billion in mandatory and discretionary spending. It's an amount that exceeds Defense Department budget caps under sequestration by $52 billion. See live coverage of the U.S. House here on C-SPAN when members gavel back in on Tuesday, 